Turn with me, if you have your Bibles, to Acts 16. We are continuing our sermon series. It's called Nameless. And this will be the last week that, that we're in it. Next week we will jump in with both feet. Thanksgiving's over, so it's okay to do Christmas from now on, right? And so we'll, we're going to jump in with both feet into uh, that. I'm excited about it. I, I've been excited about this series, and, and I hope that you have too. This series has reminded me that, that no matter whether somebody remembers my name or not, I can have an impact in their lives. And so we impact people in the moments that God calls us to impact them in, and we can make a difference in the lives of the people around us. This week's message I struggled with because I wanted to, to fit you know, something into this nameless series. And the, the first thing that popped into my mind is the leper who, you remember there were 10 lepers healed and only the one came back. And I thought, this is just perfect because that guy's nameless. And then I was like, no, nah, I preached that last Thanksgiving. Uh, can't preach it again, although I probably could have, and you probably wouldn't have remembered that I preached it last year. But I didn't want to do that. And, and so I was thinking, and I was thinking, what in the world can I preach? Um, I began to think about Thanksgiving, and I began to think about the, the different things that come with Thanksgiving, and I thought of holiday dinners we have family over to our house and then we go celebrate with with my wife's family and i began thinking about the people who are lost that will be at our thanksgiving meals and i thought maybe that's what i ought to talk about and i began to think about how sometimes we can't seem to help ourselves that we want our loved ones to come to christ so bad that sometimes at Thanksgiving dinner and sometimes at Christmas dinner, we tend to overemphasize the gospel to them and we end up probably pushing them away more than we, uh, more than we help. And so, I mean, uh, these are the conversations where we tell them, you know, if you don't change your ways, you're going to hell or you're going to be left behind faster than Kirk Cameron in that movie. And, and these people that don't even know anything about Jesus, that doesn't resonate with them, and we end up pushing them away. And, and I thought of instances in my own life where relatives did that to me and, and when I wasn't living for Christ. And, and I just wondered how much irreparable damage is done by our good intentions and our desire to, for our loved ones to see them come to Christ. And so sometimes when we use this one size fits all approach to evangelism with our families, we can do more harm than good. Not telling you you shouldn't witness to your relatives. You all know me better than that. Uh, but what I'm saying is you working Jesus or hell into every conversation is not going to do any good. You're sitting there watching the, the, the Lions play football because they always play on Thanksgiving, and there's an awesome punt, and, the, and then your, your son says, man, Dad, did you see that punt? And you're like, man, the Lord really blessed him with a great leg, didn't he? <laughs> not going to do any good. Grandma, it is hot in here. I've made it that way on purpose because I want you to feel how hot hell's going to be if you don't change your ways. <laughs> Not going to be effective. <laughs> Listen, both statements may be true, but it's not effective. You have to realize for your loved ones to enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, number one, they have to be drawn in by the Holy Spirit. And number two, your statements need to coincide with what the Spirit is telling you to say, not just your desire and your intent uh, to, to get them saved. So our text today 
is Acts chapter 16. Three people are listed in Acts chapter 16 we're going to look at. One has a name. She doesn't fall into our, into our series. Her name is Lydia. But the other two are nameless people. They're nameless, but they're not meaningless. And so as we begin reading, we'll start reading in Acts 16, verse 12. But let's just set the stage. Acts 16, 12, we'll start reading in verse 13, tells us that, that Paul is in Philippi. If you've been here on Wednesday nights as we go through our Bible study, we've been reading uh, and studying the book of Philippians. These three people that we're reading about would have been founding members of the church at Philippi. These would be three of the people Paul is writing about that we've been studying these last few weeks because when Paul got to Philippi, there was not a single person there other than him and his entourage serving Jesus. And so the first three converts in Philippi were a woman named Lydia, a slave girl who was possessed, and a jailer. These three people couldn't be any more different from each other, but they were the first three converts. And each one of them finds hope in Jesus Christ in a different way than the other. I want you to see that today. How did the conversion of these three individuals happen? How did the message of Jesus come to them? And, and how did the gospel transform them? We're going to see that Lydia is a story of the gospel for the religious person. The slave girl is a story of the gospel for the oppressed. And the jailer is the story of the gospel for your normal just everyday person. So we're going to start by looking at Lydia in Acts 16, verse 13. It says, On the Sabbath day we went outside, we as Paul and his entourage, and, and Luke's with them now. Luke is the one writing this book. We went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together, one who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And she was after she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. So here's what we know just from that passage. We know Lydia is a wealthy businesswoman. You say, how do you know she's wealthy? Because she sells purple goods. Purple was rare in those days. The, the dye that was needed to make purple was not something you found everywhere. She was a high-end retailer, probably fashion, luxury goods. She dealt in purple. I know that sounds strange because... You can get whatever color you want now. But in those days, that's not the way that it was. The scripture says she was a worshiper of God. You say, what does that mean? That, that refers to somebody who's not Jewish, but they're trying to study God and they're trying to, to, uh, to seek God by using the Hebrew Scriptures. It, it's a Gentile who's, who's using the Hebrew Scriptures to try to experience God. She's religious, but she doesn't know Jesus, and she doesn't understand the gospel because she's never heard it. So she's a wealthy, high-end businesswoman. She owns her own home. You know she's, she's doing pretty good at business for a woman to own a home in that day was, was unheard of. And so Paul is out. He's looking for this place to pray on the Sabbath. He and his entourage run into this group of women who are meeting every Sabbath day to study the Scriptures. And so Paul starts teaching them. And he starts going through. He starts reasoning with them. He starts connecting all the dots in their Bible, in the, in the Old Testament. And, and, and so he's, he's beginning to show them this is how... This points to Jesus. This is how the sacrificial system 
points to Jesus. This is how the Ten Commandments point to Jesus. And he's going through and he's reasoning with them. And, and, and she sees something clicks in her and she begins to relate to this. And she sees how the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus fulfills all of these things that they've been studying about every single Sunday. And verse 14 says, The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. The Lord opened her heart. There was something about Paul's teaching and the power of the Holy Spirit upon her that made Jesus attractive to her. That, that made a relationship far more important than the religion that she'd been following. She saw the beauty of having her sins forgiven by Jesus and that her forgiveness was not based on something she could achieve but based on God's finished work on the cross. And, and up to this point, she'd been trying to be religious. She'd been trying to, to do all of these things to earn her way in to heaven. She was observing the Ten Commandments. She was following all the rules. She was meeting every, every Sunday. But she was living in fear that if she didn't do one thing right, then the end result was not going to be good. Don't look around, please. Have you ever noticed... That religious people are some of the grumpiest people in the world. Have you really? Have you, have you ever? You, you know why that is? I'm about to tell you. Because religious people are trying to appease their own conscience that they've done enough, that they're good enough, that they've not sinned too little or, or too much, and, and that they have earned their way in. And so they're constantly grumpy because they don't think inside that they're good enough to do these things, and they're constantly comparing themselves to others. And they're saying, well, I know I'm bad, but look at him. I'm not near the mess that that person is. And that's what religion does to you. As you begin to try to work your way up to God, you realize, I can never be good enough. I can never do all of these things to get me up that ladder high enough. And so you're grumpy when you fail. You're grumpy whenever you see somebody else failing. And, and then you're happy for a little bit because you think, well, I'm not like that person. Paul comes along. And he says, it's not about these steps of the ladder that you're doing. It's about God's grace and it's about God's forgiveness. And you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And there's a security to what he's saying about the gospel. And now she doesn't have to work her way up. Now she realizes that Jesus worked his way down to us, to our level. He came to us. And, and it's not that she stopped obeying the Ten Commandments. It's not that she stopped being a moral person. But now her motivation is different. She's not working her way up to God. Now her motivation to do the Ten Commandments and to live morally is that she had a God who came down to this earth and loved her so much that she died for Him and she wants to please Him. So her motivation changed and her heart changed when she experienced that. Lydia was religious, but she still needed Jesus. And I can tell you, there are people all across the United States today who are religious, but they don't have Jesus. They're checking boxes, but they don't really have a relationship with Jesus. Religion is an outside-in proposition. Religion is, I can do all of these things if I live right, if I obey all the rules, then God will love me enough that He'll let me into heaven. That's religion. The gospel is an inside-out proposition. The gospel is Jesus loves me so much just as I am. He loves me so much He came to this earth. He died for me. 
And I, nothing can ever change that love for me. Nothing can ever change that love. Jesus came into my life and he embraces me completely. He loves me. And, and there's an unconditional love and there's an unconditional grace that covers my sin. And it gives me a freedom to serve God, not just, not just looking at other people, not just thinking I'm never good enough, but he loves me so much he accepts me for who I am and he loves me so much that he doesn't leave me the way that I am. He wants me to change into his image. And it's not condemnation, it's not guilt, and it's not shame that we live with every day. It's God's love. Out of that heart, you're going to see pure worship come out. That's where we see pure worship begin. We're going to look at the next person now. Now, this next person couldn't be more different. Let's just look at verse 16. And as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. That'd get old quick. <laughs> Paul, having become greatly annoyed, see, it wasn't just me, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. Verse 20 says, And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept a practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. Now we see a slave girl a nameless slave girl. She's the exact opposite. She's not living a life of luxury. She's economically opposite. She is poor as can be. In fact, she's enslaved. She is completely powerless. She's exploited by her, by her owners. She's on the opposite end spiritually of Lydia. She's as far as you can get. One's on one end, one is on the other. Lydia was religious. Lydia was moral. Lydia was reading the Bible. She was honoring the Sabbath. This slave girl is demon-possessed. Just opposite ends of the spectrum. It can't get any further between this slave girl and Lydia. Of the three people that we're going to look at, this girl's the most troubled. This girl is, the, is in the most pain. This girl's life is way more messed up than any of the other people. And, and ironically, the demons that are living inside of her know more about the gospel than the rest of the other, than, than all three of the people in this passage. I mean, they're shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way to be saved. The Bible says even demons believe and tremble. And, and these demons that are listed here seem to know more about the Bible and more about Jesus than, than anybody else in this passage. Notice how differently, though, the gospel came into this girl's life than it did with Lydia. Lydia was reached through Paul sitting down with her, teaching, reasoning with her. There was dialogue. There was conversation. This girl, there was none of that. This was a power encounter with the Lord. This was a very public demonstration of the supernatural power of God that affected her so much that, that, that God used it to change her life. She'd been following them around for days, and she's saying the same thing over and over and over. You say, what's so bad about that? You must not have a 13-year-old, a 10-year-old, and a 2-year-old. 
Because you get that mocking stuff going on in the car, and it only takes about three seconds for me to be annoyed. And it's not because I'm a grumpy religious person. It's because that's annoying. <laughs> that's what's going on here. There's all this mocking. There's all this taunting. And, and Paul did absolutely nothing. He ignored it for a little bit because he knew that if he did something about it, there were going to be ramifications later. It was going to affect his ministry. And so he didn't say anything at first. If he cast the demon out of this girl... Then, then these masters were going to be losing their cash cow because they sold her out for, for uh, fortune telling and things. And, and if she can't do that anymore, if she's lost that demon, then, then they don't have any money. They, they, he's killed her, their cash cow. But after several days, it starts to wear on you. Paul says, I don't care anymore. Can't take it anymore. Get out of her, demon. And the demon comes out. He commanded those demons by the power and authority of the name of Jesus to come out, and the demons came out, and, and, and the cash cow was indeed dead. The, the woman couldn't do this anymore. This girl wasn't just spiritually oppressed. She was also physically oppressed. She was in slavery she was in bondage. She was socially oppressed. She was the victim of this, of this evil regime that was over her. And, and here's what I need you to see. While she may have been delivered spiritually, what happened at the end of this story? She goes right back to the same thing she was in slavery. She, it's not like she could just say, I'm not going back. She's in slavery. And so she's free spiritually, but physically she goes back. We've got to start as a church not sending people back into the same situation that they come out of. We, we get this idea that we can say a prayer, we can break this spiritual oppression, and they can go back into the same circumstances that they came from, and everything will be okay, and that's not the way that it is. As a church, and I'm not just talking about here, I'm talking about as a whole, we've got to learn that we've got to start battling the oppression that's coming on the outside. We've got to start fighting those things because you can become spiritually free, but if you go back into a physical place of bondage again, more than likely you're going to go back and, and that spiritual freedom is going to be lost to the physical bondage. This woman, you, you just you think, what's she like today? Think about somebody who's hooked on meth. I've seen it in my job. I've seen it frequently. And these, they'll, they'll come and, and you'll say a prayer and they'll, they want, they don't want to be a meth addict. You might think that, but they don't. They never thought, you know, you know what I want to be when I grow up? Meth addict. Hmm, that's, that sounds like a good, good job, good occupation. I don't have to work. I just steal everything. No. That's not, but... I've, I've talked with people, they said one time of meth and I was hooked. And they'll come forward and they'll get on their knees and, and, and we'll lead them to Jesus and then they walk out the door and we don't help them on that end and they're right back into that lifestyle. And that's what I'm saying, the church has got to be better, more intentional about helping on the physical end. Third person. He's different than the other two. Lydia knows the God of the Bible because she knows the Bible. She reads it. She's in a Bible study. They meet every Sabbath. The slave girl, she knows the God of the Bible because there's this evil spirit living inside of her who knows God. And, and so she's aware of him because of that. Now you have the jailer, and there's a big difference. The jailer just doesn't care about God at all. He doesn't, he doesn't care one iota about God. The first two are attracted to God's messengers. Lydia listens. The slave girl's following them around for days. 
This guy's just there because he has to be. That is his job. He's not attracted to them. He's utterly uninterested. And the jailer is the gospel for just a normal, ordinary person in your life. Your neighbor, your co-worker, your cousin, your, your aunt, your uncle. It's just the normal person. And it begins in verse 23. It says, when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly, you notice that? Who was listening to them? The prisoners. Was the jailer? No, he didn't care. He probably heard it, but he wasn't listening to them. It says the prisoners were listening to them. Now I done lost my place. Verse 26, And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in the house. And he took them to the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Most of the time we look at this passage and we focus on Paul and Silas singing in the prison and worshiping in the prison and, and that's great. I mean, it, it, we'll talk about it a little bit in a minute, but that's not what we need to focus on here. Don't put the po focus on Paul and Silas. Put the focus on the jailer here. The jailer would likely have been a retired soldier. So he's a veteran. These civil service positions in those days were given to people who got out of, the, out of the military for one reason or the other. This would have been a good job in those days, just a solid middle class job. He wasn't going to get rich like Lydia, but he wasn't wallowing in slavery like, like the slave girl. He's right in the middle of that social structure. This guy is not going to be reached by the intellectual approach that Paul took with Lydia. He's not going to be reached with the deep spiritual encounter that he had with this slave girl. Think about this. This guy is, is more than likely retired mili military. He's this hardworking, blue-collar guy and look at how he responds when the prisoners escape. He pulls his sword out and he's getting ready to kill himself. You say, why in the world would he do that? Because in those days, if you were the jailer and a prisoner escaped on your watch, you were taken out and you were executed in the most publicly humiliating way that, that they could do. And so this guy is trying to save his family that shame this guy's trying to save his family from seeing that. All he's worried about at this point is his honor. And he says, my honor is so important to me, I'm just going to end things right here. And so he pulls out his sword and he gets ready to fall upon it. What matters most is, is honor. It's not emotion. It's not reason. It's honor. And so he's pulling his sword out and Paul says, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't do that just yet. We're all still here. Your life is spared. Don't do it. This man is so different from Lydia and the slave girl. He, he's a practical guy. He's not emotional. 
He's not super intelligent. He, he's, just, he, he's, he's spiritually indifferent. We don't see that he's listening to the worship. He, he has no spiritual interest. He's not seeking God. That's not his point. He's just going about his business. He's just going about his job. He's just doing his duty. He's not in spiritual turmoil like this slave girl was. He's, he's not a really moral person, but he's not a really bad person either. He's just a, a typical guy, middle class, secular, spiritually indifferent kind of guy. Notice how Paul's approach is different than it was with the other two. Paul brings the rationale of the gospel to Lydia. Paul brings the power of the gospel to the slave girl. But none of that would have worked with this guy. So Paul doesn't bring anything to this guy. He waits until the guy comes to him. You see that in here? This, this guy comes to Paul. You can't tell the gospel to somebody who doesn't care about it. It's ineffective. You have to show the gospel to somebody who doesn't care. And that's what happens here. When Paul and Silas arrived, they had been beaten within an inch of their lives. They're just barely hanging on. This guy's not nice to them. He puts them in, in stocks, and you say, well, what's not nice? The, listen, it's not just the whole. This was torture. This was, it, it would cramp your muscles up. It was a torture device is what stocks were. And he, he puts them in stocks. He's torturing these guys. But by the end of the passage, he's putting band-aids on all their wounds, and he's taking care of them. He, he's feeding them a meal, and he's listening to them. Something changed in that time in his heart. So what was it? Two things happened. The first thing is, He saw Paul and Silas' attitude towards suffering. They are beaten within an inch of their life. They're put in this torture device and they're still singing and they're still praising God. In the middle of their suffering, the jailer saw this thing that he couldn't understand because when we're in the midst of our suffering, our first inclination, if you're not saved, is to whine about it to complain about it, to wish that you were in a better position, these guys were rejoicing over it. They had been stripped of their clothes, says they're naked sitting there. They had been stripped of their comfort, they had been stripped of their personal freedom, but still they're praising God. Everything had been taken from them, but they're praising God. They're expressing that joy beyond all circumstances. They're expressing that peace that passes all understanding that we've studied about, that he'll later write about. Uh, the, the, the second thing is he saw them repay evil with good. They beat them within an inch of their life. They hadn't done anything wrong. They had done absolutely nothing wrong. And they beat them within an inch of a life. They throw them in the stocks. They torture them. And then this earthquake comes and they're loose. They're free. They're innocent. They could have ran. You and I probably would have ran. Anybody in their right mind would have probably ran. But not these guys. Not only did they stay, they probably convinced all the other people to stay because it says we're all here. Now that's pretty powerful right there. Why did they stay? What were they thinking? Because Paul valued this jailer's life much more than he valued his freedom, anything else. He valued this jailer's life so much that he was willing to sacrifice all that stuff for this guy's life. Paul and Silas valued this man's life 
over everything they had. And, and this jailer had not seen anything like that before. He's used to dealing with selfish people in prison. He's used to dealing with, dealing with, with criminals, hard criminals. He had never seen character. He had never seen integrity like this. He had never seen this kind of thinking, this kind of living, the, the, this way of acting. He'd never seen people probably singing praise to God whenever they're being tortured. His mind could not comprehend it. He was a practical guy. And he would never have been reached by intellectual arguments. And he would never have been reached by, by a, a spiritual force that came upon him. But after seeing the gospel lived out in a practical way, he turns his life to Christ. And he says, I don't know what you all have, but I need it. What must I do to be saved? He saw this fruit of, of, of this deeper relationship with Jesus, and, and that's what enabled them to, 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 to go through this suffering, to go through this abuse, to sing in the middle of all of that. They had a different way of living their life than anybody else did, and he couldn't fully comprehend it, but he knew it was a better way of life than what he was living he knew how he would have acted in that situation. And through the lens of Jesus Christ as displayed in the lives of Paul and Silas, this man saw how suffering can actually be saving. The jailer wanted to handle abuse and suffering himself like that. And so he said, what must I do to be saved? How do I get what you guys have? Lydia, the, the slave girl, the jailer. Here's what you need to know. Here's the purpose of this. God comes after them in three different ways. Three completely different ways. He comes at them through the mind. He comes at them through an attack of the heart. And he comes through them by, by being shocked into a changed life. Here's what else you need to know. These are not just Bible characters that lived 2,000 years ago. These are people you're going to encounter this Thursday. These are people you're going to encounter this afternoon at the restaurant. These are people you're going to encounter tomorrow as you go to your work. They are people whose types are alive and well, and we see them every single day. Lydia could be your cousin who owns her own business and she's very successful. She's not hurting for money. She, she's a very moral person. She's respectable. She's spiritually hungry and her friends would probably say she's religious because she goes to church on Christmas and she goes to church on Easter, but she doesn't understand the gospel. She's trying to work her way up she'll be reached when somebody makes an investment in her somebody gives some time to her and somebody sits down and explains the difference in the gospel and you can reach her that way analytically you can show her go through the scriptures this is how this pointed to jesus this is how this was fulfilled through jesus and and she'll begin to see that is not about religion, it's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. And then it'll begin to click, and it'll all make sense. The slave girl is your drug-addicted niece. She never wanted to be drug-addicted. She's in trouble with the law all the time, and you look down on her, not because she wants to shoplift, but because she has to shoplift, because she has this habit that she can't stop. You think she can just stop. She can't just stop. She is your drug-addicted niece. And she's not going to be one because you're intellectually arguing with her. That's not how it's going to happen. She's not going to be reached when you threaten her with hell because of her actions or you tell her she's going to miss the rapture if she keeps up her ways. 
She is going to be reached when the power of the gospel reaches in and affects her life and breaks those chains of bondage that she's having. She needs a power encounter with God. The jailer could be your brother, your cousin, your uncle, your co-worker. He's busting his back and he's trying to make his way every single day. He's just holding on because if I can just make it to retirement, everything will be good. He's not necessarily the most moral guy, but he's not an evil person either. All his needs are met, but he's not spiritually interested because he doesn't need anything from God. He lives by the motto, you mind your business about religion, I'll mind my business about it. And while you're at it, let's throw in politics and let's throw in sports teams too. Well, I don't, we don't talk about those things. Anything else again? That's, that's his motto that he lives by. He's disinterested. He's not going to be reached by you talking into his mind. He's not going to be reached when somebody shows him the gospel. He's going to be reached when there's a situation that happens in his life and he expects you to act in one way and you do a 180 and you, rela- you react in the complete opposite way. That's when he's going to be reached. And it may not even be one incident. It may be an incident that happens over a period of time that he sees and he observes These guys acted in a way he never expected them to react, this jailer. They're all gone. They're, they're, I'm just going to kill myself. No, no. We're all here. You all stayed? Yeah, because we care more about you. A woman, a slave, and a Gentile. You know what I find interesting about this? We started this series with it. We're ending this series with it. Who's preaching the gospel to these people? Paul. Paul was a Pharisee. What's Pharisee? A very devout, very spiritual Jew. He would not have let a single day go by without praying the prayer that every male Jew prayed. Do you know what that prayer included? I thank God that I'm not a woman. I thank God that I'm not a slave. And I thank God that I'm not a Gentile. Who says God does not have a sense of humor? Every day of this guy's life, he woke up and he prayed, thanking God that he wasn't these people. But something transformed his life. Because now instead of thanking God he's not one of them, now his burden is for these people. Now he's going out of his way to reach these people. He was thanking God that he wasn't. That shows us the power that the gospel ought to have in our lives. We ought to be going this way, and when God reaches down and touches us, he sends us back this way. He sends us on a new path. He transforms us. Paul's relationship with Jesus Christ transformed his life so much that he started pursuing a relationship with the very people he used to get up and and pray and thank God that he wasn't. These three people saw the gospel is for everyone. You got a rich woman, you got a poor woman, you got a middle class man, you got a religious person, you got an indifferent person, you have a demon possessed person. They're approached in different ways, but the result is the same. They all have their lives transformed by the power of God. There is nobody that is economically excluded. There is nobody that is racially excluded. There is nobody that is spiritually excluded. Sometimes we look at people and we think, oh man, I saw their Facebook post where they're talking about God. That person's way beyond help. No, they're not. Because Paul was killing Christians and God knocked him off of his horse and now he's pursuing these very people he prayed against. 
Nobody is too far gone. I don't care how atheistic your cousin is that comes to Thanksgiving dinner. He is not too far gone. Your niece is not too far gone. Nobody is too far gone. The gospel is for everybody. And when they let God in, it will transform their lives. There's no one way to present the gospel. Hellfire and brimstone is not the only way. The rapture is not the only way. Threatening people. These people don't even believe in God. Do you really think they believe that if there's no God, they're going to hell? They don't believe that. That has no impact. Here's what Paul did. Paul said, I see this lady over here sitting down, going to Bible study. She's hungry. She's close, but she's just a little off. So I'm going to sit down here and I'm going to pour some time into her. And Paul saw this girl that's following them. And he says, man, she's clearly demon-possessed. And, and, and yeah, uh, she's got to be hungry because she keeps showing up all these times. And, and, and man, if I, if I witness to her, if I cast this demon, that's going to cause me some problems. But in the end, and maybe it was his irritation that the Holy Spirit used, but he said, come out of her. And, and, and he spent the time. Nobody had probably given her that time of day before. The jailer who's sitting there says, here's what I'm going to do to reach this guy. won't do me any good to tell him the gospel because he doesn't care. But I'm going to show him the gospel. I'm going to show him that even though he put me in these chains, even though he's torturing me right now, even though I can barely move, I can barely see, I can barely speak, I'm going to sing praise to God. And I'm going to let him see it in my life. And when something happens, maybe he'll remember that and maybe he'll want what I have. He engaged Lydia with reason. He engaged the slave girl with the power of Jesus in a supernatural moment. And he met the jailer and lived it out in front of him with faith in the midst of suffering. Each person was reached in a different way. You know where he learned that from? Jesus. Every person Jesus met was different. Jesus didn't have a spiel. Jesus didn't just, just come up and say, here's my sales pitch. Jesus met these people right where they were at. Think of John 11. Jesus' friend Lazarus had died. And Jesus comes into town. Lazarus has been dead for a while. And there's two sisters. And think about how Jesus responds to them. Martha runs up to Jesus and she said, If you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And he responds to her by saying, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone that comes to me, though he may be dead, yet he shall live again. He responded to her in power. But then here comes Mary and she says, Jesus, if you'd have just been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. Same thing that Martha just said. And how does he respond? Two words. Jesus wept. He wept with her. What's the difference? Martha needed a display of power. That's where she was in her life. Mary just needed him to hear and to listen and to weep. Jesus met both women in the exact same situation, right where they were, and he responded in two completely different ways. But what was the end result? Lazarus come forth, and Lazarus came forth. He will meet you where you are. He'll meet you where you are today if you need him to meet you there today. He doesn't just leave me the way that I am whenever He meets me, but He takes me farther than I ever thought I could go. John, will you come?
Jesus was beautiful enough for Lydia. He was powerful enough for the slave girl. And he was practical enough for the jailer. And whatever you need today, he can be that for you as well. Because he'll meet you right where you are. He comes in and he changes people's lives. I pray that Thursday, when you're sitting down at the dinner table, if anybody even does that anymore, our people are spread all around. Who has a dinner table big enough to feed a whole family? It only happens in the movies, right? But I pray when you find yourself sitting next to that unsaved one, you don't start saying, man, it sure is hot in here. That hell's going to be a lot hotter. I pray that you think you let God draw them and you rely on the Spirit to show you this is the way I want to reach them. Talk to them, but demonstrate God. Demonstrate Him. Demonstrate His power in your life. Live it out practically speaking. People want to see that. You know how many people just talk Jesus? I love DC Talk. Boy, I know some of them have went off the rail these days since they broke up. But they had this song called, What If I Stumble? And the very intro to it said, the greatest single cause of atheism in this world today is Christians. Just chew on that. But then they go on, who say, who acknowledge Jesus with their mouth and then walk out the door and deny Him with their lifestyle. Say, this is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelieving. It's a great song. You ought to listen to it. People need to see Jesus being lived out in your life. When you tell them hell's hot and you're living like you want to be there, your words have no effect. They've got to see it. May we be like Jesus. May we be like Paul. May we be empowered by the Spirit. May we listen to the Spirit. May we meet people where they're at.